Welcome to Reclaiming the Faith with Phil Baker, a podcast with a mission to reveal what the earliest Christians believed about the core issues facing us today. You can find links to all of Phil's resources at philsbaker.com. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen today and take a moment to share this podcast with your friends. Now, here's Phil. All right, well, this is episode 89 of Reclaiming the Faith. At the request of one of my Patreon subscribers, I'm doing a special episode about how the early Christians used the Sermon on the Mount to help evangelize the Roman Empire. And speaking of my Patreon channel, you can find it at uh, patreon.com slash Baker. And for $5 or more every month, you'll get two videos uh, each month. And you'll have access to all of my previous videos that I've put there. Every month I put out one video on an early Christian or an early Christian document that'll last about 20 minutes. And then I do another video where I put out an acoustic version of one of my original songs. And lately, the last two months, I've done acoustic versions of songs off my upcoming album, Kingdom Come, which should be here in the next uh, couple of months. So be on the lookout for that. Well, if you're blessed by this episode, please consider leaving a positive rating and review on my Apple podcast channel, uh, Reclaiming the Faith. And you can also find these episodes of Reclaiming the Faith on BDK's Omega Frequency YouTube channel, which I'm also a part of. So please go check that out and check out all the great things that BDK and Kurt are doing over there at Omega Frequency. And finally, the early Christian quotes that I use can generally be found on the CD-ROM version of the Anti-Nicene Christians, which you can find, which you can buy for a mere $5 on the Scroll Publishing website, scrollpublishing.com. Well, without any further ado, let's get episode 89 rolling. Well, one of the most eye-opening stats I've come across in my life is that by the beginning of the fourth century, Christianity made up one-tenth of the Roman Empire, despite being an illegal religion. So how in the world could that happen? Well, the early Christians highly valued evangelism and discipleship, But the question then becomes, what type of evangelism strategy did they use? The Ray Comfort way of the master method, the four spiritual laws, the ABC approach? Well, what I found as I read the anti-Nicene writings is that there were two main approaches and they both involved the Sermon on the Mount. By far, the passage quoted the most by the early Christians is from Matthew chapter 5. Starting in verse 43, you have heard it that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This passage is at the heart of the early Christian evangelism method because it was at the heart of Jesus' teachings. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 8, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more than having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. The earliest Christian document outside of the New Testament is the first century work called the Didache, which means the teaching. Basically, 
It served as a catechism of sorts to help new converts understand the core teachings of the faith. The Didache presents two roads, two paths, two approaches toward life that humans take. The first is the way of life, and the second is the way of death. Listen to these opening lines of this document, which was viewed as almost on par with the 27 books of the New Testament. There are two ways, one of life and one of death. There is a great difference between the two ways. The way of life is this. First, you shall love the God who made you. Secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. And whatsoever you would not have someone do to you, do not do to another. Now, the teaching of these words is this. Bless those that curse you and pray for your enemies and fast for those that persecute you. For what credit is it to you if you love those that love you? Do not even the heathens do the same? But for your part, love those that hate you and you will have no enemy. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? That after calling us to keep the greatest two commandments, the author of the Didache says the first way we practically live out these commands are to bless those that curse you and pray for, the, for our enemies and fast for those that persecute us. For what credit is it to us if we only love those that love us? Because even the heathens do that. But for us, we should love those that hate us, and then we will have no enemies. But, someone might say, that passage must be an example of Jesus using hyperbole. I mean, it just isn't practical. Surely, God does not expect His followers to actually put those teachings into practice, right? Christianity would be wiped off the face of the earth. Well, the early Christians did not view the command to love our enemies as hyperbole. They understood it as an imperative and one of the most effective methods of evangelism. They taught and lived out this command in the face of unimaginable persecution without resorting to retaliation. And again, by the beginning of the fourth century, Christianity made up one-tenth of the Roman Empire, despite being an illegal religion. So, the two factors that led to such successful evangelism and discipleship in the first three centuries of Christianity were, one, preaching the simple words of Christ, and two, living out the simple words of Christ, particularly Jesus' commands in the Sermon on the Mount, to love our enemies and bless those that persecute us. What those two approaches also demonstrate is that Jesus not only died in the way he said he would, but he also resurrected like he said he would, and he poured out his Holy Spirit upon his followers to transform them to become like him, just like he said he would. What I want to do now is to read for you several early Christian quotes that demonstrate this twofold evangelism approach. And the majority of these quotes come from apologies or letters written to the Roman Empire as a defense of the faith. So here's the first from Justin Martyr around the year 160 AD. He writes, We who were filled with war and mutual slaughter and every wickedness have each throughout the whole earth changed our warlike weapons, our swords into plowshares and our spears into implements of tillage. And we cultivate piety, righteousness, philanthropy, faith, and hope, which we have from the Father Himself through Him who was crucified. And now it is evident that no one can terrify or subdue us who have believed in Jesus over all the world. For it is plain that, though beheaded, 
and crucified and thrown to wild beasts and chains and fire and all other kinds of torture that we do not give up our confession. But the more such things happen, the more do others and in larger numbers become faithful and worshipers of God through the name of Jesus. For just as if one should cut away the fruit bearing parts of a vine, it grows up again and yields other branches flourishing and fruitful. Even so, the same thing happens with us. Now, we pray for our enemies and try to win those who hate us unjustly so that they too may live in accordance with Christ's wonderful teachings, that they too may enter into the ex expectation, and that they too may receive the same good things that we receive from God, the ruler of the universe. Here's Athenagoras in another apology to the Roman Empire around the year 177. He writes, If I go minutely into the particulars of our doctrine, let it not surprise you. It is that you may not be carried away by the popular and irrational opinion, but may have the truth clearly before you. For presenting the opinions themselves to which we adhere as being not human but uttered and taught by God, we shall be able to persuade you to think to not think of us as atheists. What then are those teachings in which we are brought up? I say to you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, pray for them that persecute you, that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven, who causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Allow me here to lift up my voice boldly in loud and audible outcry, pleading as I do before the philosophic princes. For who of those that reduce syllogisms and clear up ambiguities and explain etymologies or of those who teach homonyms and synonyms and predicates? predicaments and axioms, and what is the subject and what is the predicate, and who promised their disciples by these and such like instructions to make them happy? Who of them have so purged their souls as, instead of hating their enemies, to love them, and instead of speaking ill of those who have reviled them, to abstain from which is itself an evidence of no, means, of no mean forbearance, to bless them? and to pray for those who plot against their lives. But among us, you will find uneducated persons and artisans and our old women who, if they are unable in words to prove the benefit of our doctrine, yet by their deeds they exhibit the benefit arising from their persuasion of its truth. They do not rehearse speeches, but exhibit good works. When struck, they do not strike again. When robbed, they do not go to law. They give to those that ask of them and love their neighbors as themselves. Here's Tertullian around the year 197 in his first apology. He writes, We never do good with respect of persons, for in our own interest we conduct ourselves as those who take no payment either of praise or premium from man, but from God, who requires and impartial benevolence. For we are the same to emperors as to our ordinary neighbors. We are equally forbidden to wish ill, to do ill, to speak ill, or to think ill of all men. The thing we must not do to an emperor, we must not do to anyone else. If we are enjoined then to love our enemies, as I have remarked above, whom have we to hate? If injured, we are forbidden to retaliate, lest we become as bad ourselves. Who can suffer injury at our hands? In regard to this, recall your own experiences. How often you inflict gross cruelties on the Christians, partly because it is your own inclination and partly in obedience to the laws. How often, too, the hostile mob paying no regard to you, takes the law into its own hand and assails us with stones and flames. Yes, and the Caesars too would have believed on Christ if either the Caesars had not been necessary for the world or if Christians could have been Caesars. 
His disciples also, speaking of Jesus, spreading over the world, did as their divine master bade them. And after suffering greatly themselves from the persecutions of the Jews, and with no unwilling heart, as having faith undoubting in the truth, at last by Nero's cruel sword sowed the seeds of Christian blood at Rome. The oftener we are mown down by you, the more in number we grow. The blood of Christians is seed. Here's Lactantius at the beginning of the fourth century, this is somewhere between 303 and 310. They say the public rights of religion must be defended. Oh, with what an honorable inclination the wretched men go astray. For they are aware that there is nothing among men more excellent than religion, and that this ought to be defended with the whole of our power. But as they are deceived in the manner of religion itself, so also are they in the manner of religion's defense. For religion is to be defended, but not by putting to death, rather by dying, not by cruelty, but by patient endurance, not by guilt, but by good faith. For the former belongs to evil, but the latter to good. And it is necessary for that which is good to have place in religion and not that which is evil. For if you wish to defend religion by bloodshed and by tortures and by guilt, it will no longer be defended, but will be polluted and profaned. For nothing is so much a matter of free will as religion, in which, if the mind of the worshiper is, dis, is disinclined to it, religion is at once taken away and ceases to exist. The right method, therefore, is that you defend religion by patient endurance or by death, in which the preservation of the faith is both pleasing to God himself and adds authority to religion. All right, here's Aristides around the year 125. And this is also addressed to the emperor. He writes, but the Christians, O king, while they went about and made search, have found the truth. And as we learn from their writings, they have come nearer to the truth and genuine knowledge than the rest of the nations. For they know and trust in God, the creator of heaven and earth, in whom and from whom are all things, to whom there is no other God as companion, from whom they received commandments which they engraved upon their minds and observe in hope and expectation of the world which is to come. Wherefore, they do not commit adultery, nor fornication, nor bear false witness, nor embezzle what is held in pledge, nor covet what is not theirs. They honor father and mother. They show kindness to those near them. And whenever they are judges, they judge uprightly. They do not worship idols made in the image of man. And whatsoever they would not that others should do to them, they do not do to others. And of the food which is consecrated to idols, they do not eat, for they are pure. They comfort their oppressors and make them their friends. They do good to their enemies. They observe the precepts of their Messiah with much care, living justly and soberly as the Lord their God commanded them. Every morning and every hour they give thanks and praise to God for His loving kindness toward them. And they do not proclaim in the ears of the multitude the kind deeds that they do, but they are careful that no one should notice them. And they conceal their giving just as he who finds a treasure and conceals it. And they strive to be righteous as those who expect to behold their Messiah and to receive from him with great glory the promises made concerning them. So instead of seeing our enemies as threats to security and safety, the early Christians and the Lord himself call us to view our enemies as potential friends and family. And the more I've pondered Jesus's sacrifice for all of humanity and the early Christians passion to see all people embrace Christ as Lord, the more my beliefs have changed. 
Now, I won't pretend like loving and blessing enemies is an easy task. It's not. It's usually an excruciating endeavor. But when it is done with sincerity, the power of the gospel is unleashed. One morning a few years ago, I was mowing my lawn. A young mockingbird began to repeatedly dive bomb at my head. Naturally, my initial reaction was to find an old badminton racket to scare off the birdie, but it was to no avail. Mockingbirds are thugs. They often make me wish they weren't the state bird of Texas so I could take one out just to teach the others a lesson. But that morning, as I was swinging into the air and no doubt giving my neighbors a good laugh, words of Jesus began to come into my mind. Like Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those that hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to the ungrateful and evil men. So, could those values work with a thuggish mockingbird? It was worth a shot. I went inside and I got some pieces of bread. With the lawnmower not running, I went over where he was perched, whistled, dropped a couple of large crumbs and went back to mowing. The young mockingbird never went for the breadcrumbs, but it immediately stopped dive bombing at my head. Over the next month or so, that mockingbird became quite friendly. I could recognize it by a particular set of markings on its chest. It would come out every time I would mow and would often perch just a foot or two away from me. The little guy once flew over and stood on the handle of my lawnmower while it was shut off, and I was right beside it, looking at something on the ground, and we shared a moment together as it just hung out right there for about a minute. I realize how difficult the command to love our enemies is to practice. I really do. I'm a Texan, and Texans scoff at the idea of loving enemies. Texans don't really do the whole turn the other cheek thing. If you slap a Texan on the right cheek, you may get fired upon and it'll probably be legal. That is the culture I've always lived in. The way of Jesus, however, calls us to not regard anyone from a worldly point of view. A second century Christian writer, Mathetes, wrote in his letter to Diognetus, Christians live on earth but their citizenship is in heaven. They love all people and are persecuted by all. No one knows them, and yet they are condemned. They are put to death, and just through this they are brought to life. They are abused, and yet they bless. They are assaulted, and yet it is they who show respect. Doing good, they are sentenced as evildoers. When punished with death, they rejoice in the certainty of being awakened to life. In a word, what the soul is in the body, Christians are in the world. Maybe one of the main reasons that the world is in the shape that it's in currently is that Christians have lost sight of their calling. Despite all the resources we have at our fingertips, all the videos, all the books, all the curriculum, all of this help to make us evangelize effectively, we have adopted a frail apologetic. Perhaps we need to return to our roots. Perhaps instead of trying to come up with the newest and latest psychological ploy, instead of trying to mirror the crowd drawing methods of the world, we should return to preaching and living out the simple words of Christ. And then, perhaps, 
as it was with the first several generations of Christians, it will be said of us as well that what the soul is in the body, the Christians are in the world. My strength, my God is my force. 